It's, I really have to say what almost everybody says, it's an honor to speak here. I mean, when Heartland did the first, the Manhattan Conference years ago, and we attended there, we saw all these people, Fred Singer, Richard Linton, Neil Sharif, Hendrik Svensmark, and all the other people who spoke here over the years, but who were then there almost entirely, the entire crew collected. We just knew we have to do the same at home. And after a while, we actually did the same. And therefore, for me to be standing on this side and not sitting down there is a special honor. OK, not too much about this. Um, yes, talking about the fairy tale of Germany's Energiewende. I mean, I guess some of you drive or drove German cars, so German engineering is just the thing. And um, of course, they can do a lot. And, but Germany became famous in the last few years for the Energiewende, for the energy transition. Energy transition. Yeah. What does it really stand for? And um, Germany has a long history, like many developed countries, of uh, yeah, being afraid of nuclear. I mean, the, the nuclear scare is nothing really new, but in Germany it was very well cultured. We get very early a Green Party, which uh, a civic movement, which became a political party, and which became a very influential group in society. And uh, so it was an ever kind of discussion of nuclear is not so great, you know, and, but we need it, and uh, yeah. And then what happened? Fukushima. When Fukushima happened in 2011, our Chancellor, Helmut, uh, not Helmut Kohl, no, our Chancellor Angela Merkel, she ordered that, okay, now, this is so dangerous, actually we should, we should have to switch off uh, the power plants. He ordered that the oldest power plants are kind of immediately switched off. And just 11 days later, she called in for an ethics commission, a commission with the objective to design how we phase out nuclear without actually then becoming dependent on the power, nuclear power from abroad, from power plants who might even le less save than ours. So, and this um, ethics commission, and even in 2011, we already lived, I have to say, in the time of insanity. None of these members of the ethics commission had any energy background was not an expert, but they were supposed to represent society. I mean, nothing against society, because we all are society. But, I mean, when you have leaders from the churches, trade union leader, CEO, and political uh, appointees to decide over how we face out nuclear, I, I would not have uh, chosen exactly these people. They're, sure, they're able people, but it wouldn't have been my first choice when we think about how can we face out nuclear. And um, so it was decision to face out nuclear until 2022, which is end of next year. And you, what, I, what you see there is a percentage of nuclear power in electric, on the in power generation from 2000 to 2020, which of course, um, yeah, then projected the last bit is not entirely now correct. So, but you see, it was on average, it made 30%, it contributed 30% to our electricity supply. Reliable, safe, there were never ever significant incidents. And if you know how the Germans can be so meticulous, so that every accident, even if somebody, let's say, cut his hand in a power plant. This was an incident in a power plant. So they really took it very serious, which is, which is fine. So the roadmap was, OK, we phase out nuclear. And uh, so we already switched a couple of them off. And here is the other last ones on the map. You see, by the end of the year, we have one, two, three going off the grid, and end of next year, the last three, and then, yeah, what happens next? And, um, but at least for the time being, the lights don't go out. 
This is what the pictures, I mean, I don't know, it sends me shivers down my spine when I see a picture like this because it really means you can't switch it back on. You know, it's really gone for good. So, what's next? I mean, media last disaster. The media doesn't write about planes that don't crash, so every disaster, it of course, makes it into the news, which is normal. It's a nat human natural desire to be informed about disasters, but we talked about it in other sessions and panels uh, at length, you know, how we are flooded, you know, with disaster news, with doomsday news, and um, yeah. For the time being, you know, the backbone of uh, our power supply in Germany were lignite and hard coal power plants in combination with nuclear power plants. And what you see here is, um, it's of course a matter, it's very subjective how you like this, but I think this is a beauty of German engineering. It's one of the newest power plants in Germany. It went on the grid in 2015. Has an electric efficiency of over 45 percent and by using <clears throat> waste heat we come to a um, power efficiency of 70 percent because it heats about 120,000 homes and provides it with hot water. So the city of Mannheim and city of Heidelberg, this is the region where the power plant is located, <clears throat> many households depend on it and we know when we talk about phasing out even coal, I just wonder who, who and how you want to heat the homes, how you want to provide the water. And by the way, you provide electricity for 1.2 million people. And okay, but okay, so we, we go on. Germany <clears throat> set up another ethics commission, this time a bit more on a larger scale. There were about th over 30 people. And it goes without saying, Guess how many real energy experts were in this group? None. And therefore they were, I mean, it was quite a lengthy discussion. I don't want to make fun about it. It's just, I think it's a bit uh, weird when we talk about something like, how do we place what we use for over 100 years to generate electric power, reliable, safe, and in the last, let's say, 40 years, even very, very clean. Air pollution, this is something we have to uh, keep in mind. Air pollution from power plants, weren't an issue in the last 40 years. I mean, the, the exhaust emissions were already so strict that you can't call, can't call coal-fired plants dirty plants. Okay, the coal, of course, is a bit dirty, but what it comes out of the exhaust is just water vapor and carbon dioxide and some air. Okay, to the point. So, 2038, that's now the the final day when we have to switch off the last power plant. And uh, so let's go to the year 2020. And because Germany is always quoted as the example, you know, for going green, meaning especially going for wind and solar. And if you look at these uh, charts, <clears throat> you see the, I don't know whether I can read the, the fine print, the largest one on the big side, this is wind generation. So. If you see the power mix, and we talk actually about here the electricity mix, it's not really the energy mix as such, because in primary energy, like in almost all countries in the world, <clears throat> it, is, it is fossil, you know, the backbone. But we talk about now here about electricity generation, because the energy transition for the time being it has a major focus on. Can we get some water? Is there money? some water here? Some? Anyway. Oh, later. <clears throat> Sorry. And um, so we have the first two. Oh, excellent. In this time of heightened security, I really appreciate it. Sorry. So, so 2020, wind and lignite are now the big providers for energy. You would say, okay, why, why is this guy here talking about the fairy tale or whatever, maybe failed energy transition? The interesting thing is, we have, um, oh, I really, I really appreciate it, thanks a lot. We have in Germany, which I, which I mentioned briefly on, uh, on the first morning yesterday, they have installed capacity 
of green energy of <coughs> over 130,000, <coughs> no, about more than 130,000 <coughs> megawatts. So this is about 50% more installed green energy generation capabilities, meaning wind and solar, if they run at their 100% capacity, provide 50% more electricity than we actually ever use in even the, the worst moment. I mean, like in winter when it's cold and so, but, yeah, there is a famous but. It's just the same graph, actually just uh, in a different, I mean, same numbers in the same thing. The wind is a major thing, and um, let's go further. I just mentioned, you know, the installed capacity of wind and solar. This graph is a bit um, not super, not so easy to see, uh, understand. The, the light blue, almost, what a turquoise, turquoise color, what you see there, this, the field, this is installed capacity over the years from 2010 to 2020 of onshore wind power. So you can see, okay, so we, if we take 2020, we are about at 55 gigawatts. 55 gigawatts is about 20%, uh, no, anyway, that, that's, that's not important. I don't want to confuse it. So we talk about 55 gigawatts, which is, uh, which in theory these wind farms can generate. Now you see these, the dark blue, these spikes. These spikes are the actual generation from wind power. I mean, that's, that's, it's, that's, it's not a graphic trick. This is really what we can draw from wind power. And now you see the, the, on top of it, you see the um, offshore wind. Offshore came fairly late, is why it comes late. So the other steps to the right, which grow a little bit, is offshore wind. And to see how much offshore wind contributes, it's, the, it's this kind of like neon green on the bottom. So the ratio actually between um, installed capacity and real output is uh, there slightly better. So, we are an industrialized country. We need power 24 hours. And, I mean, you don't have to be an expert in anything to see this doesn't add up. It does not add up. And when we go back and you see, okay, where the distribution of energy sources used for cross electricity generation in the same year. You see, suddenly natural gas, gas, 16%. So this natural gas is actually jumping in where we had the switch of nuclear, where we have the phasing out coal plants, and um, and I show you the next one, solar and wind. So I always talk about the installed capacity of wind, and we understood there is not so much we can really uh, draw from. And the yellow thing is full load, I mean, yellow is solar, and if you look at the full load hours in percent, you see that from the installed capacity, when people say, wow, so and so many gigawatts installed of solar uh, wind panels, they provide, on average, six to seven percent. So if somebody says, I have a one gigawatt solar installation, which is really impressive, said, yes, it's right, but over the year, you get about 7% out of it, of the installed. It's always watts peak, you know? It's almost when you buy a hi-fi system in the old day, there was like, oh, the maximum what you can get out. And here, what does it mean? You have to substitute it. We have to substitute it, and <clears throat> for the time being, we have the coal-fired plants, which can go a little bit uh, to 100%, and you know, engineers are usually, they're very super smart, they have these reserves, like when you have, people who are in the space program, they know when you build a satellite, over the years, you know, you have these 
better technology and you build it in and you know, okay, we designed it for five years, but then it works for 13 years. So, but you don't talk about it and you're just happy that you manage. And, it, and with the engineers over the world, it's a bit similar. So that's why we still manage. So, now comes something very interesting. We talked, or I showed you how we really can't rely. I mean, we, we never really get the 100% out of the solar or wind. Now we are very specific. We look at the first quarter of the year from 2015 to 2021. This is very, very interesting. I think this is, for my opinion, one of the second most interesting graphs we have. Because you see that, you saw on the other graphs, our wind and solar capacity is actually constantly growing. So we don't we don't phase them out. I mean, we, we build more, still more wind and more solar farms. But why in 2021, why is there a significant less power generation from these sources? Particularly in the green one, the light green one, is wind. And in the first quarter of 2021, of this year, we had significantly less wind than 2020. What is so important of this graph? It shows that when we talk about, yeah, the sun is not shining every day or the wind is not blowing every day, true, it's a non-brainer. Everybody who sails knows there are days where there's not much uh, wind or so. But here we talk about weeks and weeks with not much wind. And here comes a point when people talk about batteries, you know, whatever, this storage, hydro and so on, I mean, uh, hydrogen, I mean. We talk about weeks of weak wind we actually have to bridge, where we have to substitute the, call it failing wind, with, yeah, with some other energy source. And it goes without saying that a battery, whether it's lithium or the latest Chinese technology, where you, whatever, which is cheaper and even better, they still only last for a couple of hours and then they are drained. So we, if we need here storage facility, we need storage facility that can st store energy over months and then provide it. And, um, I think everybody knows these storage facilities don't exist. And even if they we would spend all the money on the planet just to build these batteries. And um, so now people say, okay, what am I complaining? That batteries, it, it's an old thing. We go for hydrogen. I don't want to go now into details of the hydrogen, but if we really want to go for hydrogen, we need even much, much more of wind and solar farms in order to compensate the loss when we generate the hydrogen. And then again, because we generate the hydrogen and the hydrogen we use then to create synthetic methane and out of the methane we can even use, make fuel and uh, even kerosene. And uh, the one interesting point, which is a little slightly digressing from here, but still an event in Germany, there is now a group in the law, uh, let's say car lobby industry, even people who have cars and a small group of the producers, but they don't want to come out uh, actually of the closet in this regard, because everybody is on e-mobility. They, they think, oh, e-fuels. So we generate hydrogen, and out of hydrogen we make synthetic fuels, and synthetic fuels we can use like normal petrol at the petrol station and the tanker and so on. Yes. But without taxes and anything whatsoever, <clears throat> at least you will pay about $4 for a liter or so. It would probably like $15 per gallon without taxes, without any tax. Anyway, um, <clears throat> but it's a minor thing. But I just mentioned the issue we already have with power generation to, to provide uh, our industrialized country. But what we already see now, that over the last 20 years, power-intensive com companies don't invest much anymore. They still do invest. They're not obviously leaving the country, but you can see that they write off, but not necessarily reinvest how they would have done it in the past or did in the past. 
And um, so the deindustrialization of Germany, pff, it's difficult how you measure it. What is a factor? You know, I mean, the cost of doing business, whatever, we don't know. But at least energy prices are going high. Energy poverty, it's a thing, I really look deeply into it. The data, the data is not really, let's say, strong in order to prove what exactly is causing uh, energy poverty, because how they define energy poverty is means when you more than, spend more than 10 percent for your, uh, for your, of your money you have in order to keep your house heated at a so-called normal temperature. It's, it looks like that more and more people really struggle to pay the energy bill, you know, and of course people who have, uh, have a lower income are also usually more affected. It's an utter non-brainer. Uh, but it goes without saying, when people and therefore the political class and the media elite say, oh, it's great that the energy prices are so high, you know, and uh, petrol goes up, and fuel prices go up because it is good for the planet. And we, they really say this. I mean, they don't, they don't hide it. Say, no, it's good that energy becomes so expensive. This is cynic. This is cynical. And um, so, it's just the corresponding uh, graph. So <clears throat> everybody was happy until 2020 that we, oh, oh, we don't need the conventional forces. Let's blow up some more power plants. And uh, oh, oops, in 2021, good that we didn't destroy all of them yet. And, um, and just picture this. Germany wants to have cars run on electricity. E-mobility is one of the things. We subsidize it super heavily. Of course, in the end, it's like the, the normal small, small worker, little employee with little income who cross-subsidizes now the nice Teslas for people who actually are their bosses probably. Yeah? So, and, uh, so it's many years ago we said, okay, if we really go for the energy transition the way they plan it and so on, it will be a redistribution from the bottom to the top. And this is actually, you can prove it. This is actually really taking the place because if you, if you live in a flat, you know, and you just and basically live from hand to mouth, it's not easy for you to say, oh, well, let's, let's buy a solar park for what about 15 million dollars or so. It's just not possible. So what's the bottom line? All in 2014, our then Minister for Economics, he was part of the government, he already said, the truth of the energy transition is it's already close to failing. And he added later that the other countries think we are totally mad. And I think there's not much to add. And uh, this is probably the future of the energy transition. It might not happen every time. And um, I think my time is up. We have later time for questions. There are so many more things we can uh, talk about. And as I said uh, yesterday morning, you're all welcome to visit us in Germany. This time is now even the date there, so 12th to 13th November. So if you, in four weeks, not yet fully booked, I mean, with Happer and his lovely wife, they will all join us in Gera. Thanks. And uh, so many others. I mean, Richard Linson. Nir Shaviv, Hendrik Svensak, and so on. The who is who is coming to a very large extent. James will also be there. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for having me.